Welcome. My name is Jennifer Jansen, and I am Executive Director of Alberta Tomorrow. I'm thrilled to see so many Alberta teachers, students, and citizens concerned about water joining our webinar today. Today, together with Guardians of the Ice, with funding from Alberta EcoTrust, we have brought together four scientists, three from Alberta and one from the United States, to talk about water, water quality, climate change, and the Columbia Ice Field. Before having our scientists introduce themselves, I'll hand it over to my co-host, Jim Elzinga, with Guardians of the Ice, to introduce himself. Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, good morning and hi, everyone. I'm Jim Elzinga. I'm the founder of Guardians of the Ice, and I've been climbing in and around the Columbia Ice Fields since the early 70s. Over the years, I could see this beautiful jewel of the Canadian Rockies vanishing before my eyes. And I was quite curious about what was happening and wondered what was being done about it. I discovered that all I was seeing up there was a result of temperatures due, of temperatures rising due to climate change. So our inspiration at Guardians is to bring art and science together to move people about what has been lost in our own backyard at the ice fields and to inspire all of us to become active environmental stewards in our own communities. Art sees the world through the aesthetics, the psyche, the emotions. Science looks at the world through the rationale, the quantitative, things that can be measured and described. But what it does, it gives art a terrific context of understanding. So with Gardens of the Ice, we're dedicated to bringing those two parts of human understanding together to help us understand nature and humanity's relationship with nature better. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Allison Crisitello, and I am an ice core scientist. I'm the director of Canada's National Ice Core Lab, housed here at University of Alberta. And um, most of my research is polar. I work in Antarctica and the Arctic, but I'm lucky enough recently to look at um, environmental contaminant issues utilizing ice cores in the Canadian Rockies as well. Caroline? Hi, I'm Caroline Aubrey-Wake. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan in Kenmore. Uh, and my research is on glacier melt and water resources. I'm trying to understand how the changing mountains with changing snowpacks and retreating glaciers and changing rain and all these different components, I'm trying to bring them all together and see how the system is changing. So how are our mountains changing and how it's gonna impact our water resources in the future. And passing it on to Julie. Hi, I'm Julie. I'm a hydrologist and I'm the research director at the Aspen Global Change Institute, an organization dedicated to advancing um, global change science and solutions. Um, I've done a lot of work on climate change and its impact to waters in our rivers and streams in the Columbia River and then also in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, in the US. Um, I live and work in Seattle and hopefully can provide a little bit of international perspective. Um, and I often get to work closely with people at water utilities and in federal agencies in the US to understand how the information they, what information they need and how to help them um, to use current research to help to inform their decision making and excited to be here today. Um, Bob is next, Brett. My name is Bob Sanford, and I hold the Global Water Futures Chair in Water and Climate Security at the United Nations University Institute of Water, Environment, and Health. I am also the author of Our Vanishing Glaciers, The Snows of Yesteryear, and The Future Climate of the Mountain West. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate with this distinguished panel on this webinar. We in the Canadian West live in some of the most impressive natural features on, on Earth. Many of these are protected within the UNESCO Canadian Rocky Mountain Parks World Heritage Site. One of the most spectacular of these is the Columbia Icefield, by any standard, the Columbia Icefield is a stunning geographical feature. 
It is a high basin of accumulated snow and ice that straddles some 220 square kilometers of the Great Stone Divide that separates British Columbia from Alberta. It is one of the last places in Canada where weather and water interact in exactly the same way they did during the last ice age. What makes this ice field truly unique, however, is its accessibility. At the Athabasca Glacier in Jasper National Park, you can literally get out of your car and in a few moments walk directly back into the Pleistocene, a colder epoch in the Earth's history when much of North America was buried deep beneath two kilometers of glacial ice. There's a different sense of time here. Fleeting hours hardly matter. The day seems the smallest unit of time, the season the next, then the year. Beyond that, there is only the timelessness of epochs. Beyond the experience of the utterly monumental in nature, even a brief visit to the Columbia ice field teaches us that water is a central element in determining what the surface of the earth was like at any given moment in its history. The Columbia ice field is a place water comes to be reborn. It is where all three phases of water, solid, liquid, and vapor, coexist and interact. This range between minus 40 and plus 40 degrees Celsius is absolutely critical to tolerable climate variability and to life processes on this planet. And at the center of that range is the freezing point of water. Because water likes it up here so much, it's no surprise that these mountains are the water towers for much of Western North America. The melting of snow in the spring and the melting of glaciers in the summer has provided water security for much of the West, including the prairies, which in places are so dry they contribute no water to local rivers. It should be no surprise then that the Columbia ice field is also famous as another divide, a hydrologic divide. This sea of stone and snow is the headwaters of the three greatest rivers of the West. The Saskatchewan Glacier is the headwaters of the North Saskatchewan River. The Columbia ice field and Columbia Glacier are the headwaters of the Peace Athabasca Mackenzie River system which is so big that it rivals the St. Lawrence in scale, and it's been called Canada's cold Amazon. The glaciers pouring down the west slopes of the Great Divide from the Columbia ice field nourish the Columbia River, once known as the Great River of the West, in honor of how all life relied on its waters. Not enough snow is falling, however, in our now warming winters, and much of it, and too much of it is melting away during the longer, hotter summers to sustain our mountain glaciers. The Columbia ice field is seen to have lost as much as a third of the area prescribed to it in the 1990s. We don't yet know its volume, but we do know that many of the Columbia ice field glaciers are shrinking in extent and thinning in depth at a rapid rate. And if you consider glacial ice as water in the bank, so to speak, we don't have as much as we thought, and it's disappearing far faster than we could ever imagine. Recent research demonstrates just how rapidly our climate is warming. Through the efforts of the IP3 Research Group and the Western Canadian Cryospheric Network, we now know that we may have lost as many as 300 glaciers in the Canadian Rocky Mountain parks alone between 1920 and 2005. The point that I would like to leave you with is that the hydrology of the entire West is changing and changing fast. It should be noted also that the loss of glacial ice is a symptom of a much larger problem. The same warming that is causing our glaciers to disappear so quickly is reducing snowpack and the duration and extent of snow cover through the mountain west. Snowpack and snow cover have been declining by 17% per decade. By mid-century, the Canadian west will be as changed by this 
as it was by European settlement. The problem you will have to manage in your lifetimes is that you have to see and understand this hydrologic change. I've been invited to conclude with final thoughts on what is happening and to do so in about one minute. Let me begin with a question. Why is it that every disaster movie begins with a scientist being ignored? For young people listening to this, you should never doubt that you can make a difference. You may not yet have a lot of experience, but you are smart, clear-sighted, and connected. You have the power to reshape the world, and I'm afraid that you must. The world we have left you is not enough for you. You must decide upon and then create the world you want. There are a number of things that you can do now. Because the global atmosphere is warming, Canada's hydrology has already begun to change. We need to dispel the myth of limitless abundance of water in Canada, and we need to do it now. To make change possible, each of us needs to know where the water that comes out of our taps comes from, how much we use, and what we use it for, and what condition it is restored to the water course from which it was drawn. But most of all, we need to realize that water is going to be more precious in the future than we can even begin to imagine today and act accordingly. Over to you, Ali. Okay. Um, well, broadly, um, our work on the Columbia Ice Field uh, focuses on drilling ice cores on snow dome in order to quantify historical deposition rates and also estimate ice field inventories of organic and inorganic pollutants to the Canadian Rockies. And in doing so, we hope to gain a better understanding of how global warming will impact future water quality through the release of legacy contaminants during melt. And these are chemicals that have been banned and are no longer in use. And ultimately we will pair our ice chemistry results with water quality results collected in river samples and in raw and treated drinking water to assess the potential risk to downstream ecosystems and people. Um, so as you'll hear a little bit more about this, um, water is a very critical natural resource in Western Canada. Uh, and the Saskatchewan, Athabasca, and Columbia rivers, which eventually drain into the Atlantic, Arctic, and Pacific oceans, all originate in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. And these river systems are important sources of drinking water for many major cities, uh, including where I'm sitting in Edmonton. And the glaciers that I, and ice fields that currently occupy the Canadian Rockies formed over thousands of years through the gradual accumulation of snowfall and its compaction into fern and then ice. And in this way, an environmental record of the atmosphere gradually accumulates over time. So glacial ice is a particularly useful and powerful natural archive because each year's snowfall preserves this information at really high resolution. So ice cores uh, provide some of our best records of past uh, temperature change, heavy metal and black carbon pollution, and patterns in organic chemical deposition, just uh, as a few examples. And as these glaciers and the ice fields that feed them melt, water is released to downstream ecosystems, which includes all of their archived organic and inorganic pollutants. And these pollutants may have been emitted to the atmosphere hundreds or even thousands of kilometers away from where the ice is, um, but it deposits on the surface and then remains trapped there until some point later in time. Now melting glaciers and ice fields have been shown in the past to be sources of things that humans are concerned about, such as metals, organic chlorine pesticides, and other pollutants to downstream freshwaters. So contaminants that have accumulated over many, many years can be released very rapidly downstream uh, into downstream ecosystems in a warming climate. So these legacy contaminants that we call them, they include uh, some examples that you might have heard of DDT, PCBs and brominated flame retardants. And these were historically used at lower elevations for things like pest control and industrial applications, but they also have cold condensed into higher altitude snowpacks and glaciers. 
And by cold condense, I mean that they enter the gas phase at low elevations, where air temperatures are relatively warm, but then they condense out of the atmosphere when they're transported into higher, colder regions. So we actually just got out of the field um, a few weeks ago. Uh, it was our first of a few field seasons, and all these photos are from a few weeks ago on the Columbia Ice Field. So I just thought I'd show you real quick what it looked like. Um, we drilled a bunch of shallow cores, and we took some uh, discrete snow surface samples for some other specific contaminant analyses. Um, so we, uh, you can ski up there, but we, we flew up because we had little time and a drill. Um, so we flew up and set up a very minimalist camp. This is what it looks like kind of on the plateau area um, where Snow Dome is. And uh, we got to work right away drilling some ice cores with this thing called a COVAX, uh, which we drilled maximum 25 meter cores. Um, and you'll see that green thing is um, actually a battery powered motor. So we had no fuel anywhere near the site. You don't want to have any potential for introducing some of the things we're actually trying to measure for. So, um, so that was a, a battery, a new attempt at a battery powered head and we manually extracted the cores. Um, so no fuel used. Um, and then in terms of what happens with the cores from there, we don't do too much in the field outside of measuring them, weighing them, and then package them, packaging them for transport back here uh, for analysis at the ice core lab. And just as a, a this is not everything, but this is a, a quick list of some of the things that we're going to utilize these cores for. Um, and I've included what we'll, we're going to gather some more cores um, next spring as well. So what's listed here as core one are kind of the things that we usually almost always measure in ice cores, the physical properties, major ions, things like sea salts, uh, things that actually come uh, from the ocean. We're going to measure oxygen isotopes, which um, allow us to reconstruct temperature in the past and facilitate dating of ice cores. We'll measure black carbon, which gives us um, a forest fire history, among other things. And then I've listed just a few uh, of potential interest to folks watching um, contaminants that we're quite interested to see um, what we find. The first one, PFAS, um, you may have heard of these too. They've been in the news a lot recently. They're synthetic chemicals that are found in a lot of products, food packaging and household cleaners. Um, and certain types of PFAS don't break down in the environment or the human body. So there's a lot of concern about these in the environment. Um, PFCAs, they're a very large class of compounds. Uh, an example of one is that the production of Teflon utilizes uh, PFCAs. And some of these are bioaccumulative, and we truly don't know enough about their toxicity uh, to plants or invertebrates, which is the scariest part of this, that we just don't know yet what this grand experiment is doing um, in the environment. And then PACs I list here too. They have, PACs have a natural source, forest fires, but they also have an anthropogenic source uh, from fossil fuel burning. And together, PACs and black carbon can tell us um, a little bit more also about, um, about surface darkening uh, on the Columbia ice field, which of course increases solar radiation and, and melting. Um, and lastly, we did do some discrete sampling for these organochlorine pesticides that I mentioned, um, DDT being a, a really um, commonly known example of an OCP. And that involved really interesting specific cleanliness requirements. Uh, and finally, we also discreetly sampled for microplastics, which is something that uh, we even do at polar sites recently, um, looking for actual tiny bits of plastic um, in these really remote locations, um, which is something else that we care about in terms of human and food chain health in general, um, and also has a really interesting set of sampling requirements and cleanliness requirements. Um, so that's, that's it, the take home for, this area of research um, that I'm, I'm leading with Alberta Environment and Parks is, is that we really hope to provide an inventory of these compounds within the ice field that could potentially be, be released into downstream aquatic environments as warming and melt continue. Thanks, uh, Caroline. Thanks, Ali. Well, um, Caroline's getting her presentation up. Um, 
Uh, I'd like to hear more about the cleanliness requirements of your um, sampling for the microplastics and the DDT. Maybe we can address that in the, um, in the question period later. Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, um, can you all see my screen well? Yes, yes. perfect. Um, so I'm Caroline, as I introduced myself earlier, and some of my work as a glacier hydrologist is that I focus on uh, the impact of forest fires on glacier melt. Um, and one of the reasons that I've been looking at this quite a bit in the last year or so is because um, forest fires have really been uh, impacting our, our environment. So uh, over the last few years, we've really seen, it's been in the news and here in Kenmore, I remember in the last few summers, there are days that I couldn't really go outside because there was too much smoke that it was hard to breathe or it would be raining ashes on my car. And for some people, it's been even worse when people have been evacuated. Um, and it seems like forest fires are just going to become more and more common with climate change. Um, so in my work, I've been trying to understand more how this forest fire activity is impacting glacier melt. Um, so here we're looking at a map of Western Canada. So we have uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, the United States. And we see here that when there's fire activity, either in BC or in the United States, the smoke can travel uh, quite far and wide. And one of the places that it affects is the Columbia ice field, as we've been uh, focusing on in this location today. And um, it is one of the glacier that, for my PhD work, we study. So we have instruments on that glacier that record the weather and that can help us better understand how the smoke is impacting the melt. So how does it work? Um, so here we have two pictures. Uh, they are taken the same summer, uh, one in June and the other one in September. And you can see they're quite different. One day, blue sky, beautiful day. Uh, the other day, a little bit more apocalyptic, uh, very orange sky. And just these two pictures give us a pretty good idea of what is going on, uh, how the smoke is impacting the melt. So first of all, the smoke uh, blocks the sun. So instead of having a bright blue sky, um, you have an orangish gray sky that will prevent some of the sun from hitting the ice surface. Then you also have a darker surface. So all that smoke can deposit on the ice and these little dust particles will then um, ingrain themselves in the ice crystals and make the glacier darker. And these two things together change the melt. Um, so first we need to know, to, to understand how it impacts the melt, we first need to know what is smoky weather. So uh, we, have a wet, we have a camera at the Columbia Ice Field that takes pictures every day, three times a day for the entire summer. And then we can go through these pictures and define, okay, when is it sunny? When is it cloudy? When do we have smoke? And uh, I don't know if you guys have been to the Columbia Ice Field, but if you've been, it's likely it was cloudy because it happens more than 50% of the time that it's cloudy. <laughs> I have the numbers. It's totally okay if you go and it's, uh, you see nothing. It's normal. Um, <laughs> and so we are able to track the weather and see when everything is happening. And then we go into our weather station and we go and see the days that were smoky, how was the temperature, how was the precipitation, or how was the wind? and we're able to compare the different types of weather. And what we find is that when it's smoky, uh, we don't have a lot of sunlight. So we have quite an, the smoke has quite an impact on the amount of sun energy that reaches the surface, but it's also hotter and drier than other types of day. So it's like a cloudy day, but instead of being kind of damp, it's hot and dry. Um, so now that we know what's going on with the air, what's going on with the weather when it's smoky, we can look at what's going on with the surface. And so, the surface gets darker because the smoke deposits. And that is really important because the color of the ice will actually be a really, really strong factor on how it melts. So um, in a nutshell, white will reflect the sun's energy and black will absorb the sun's energy, which is the same reason that walking barefoot on asphalt in the summer uh, is really unpleasant. But if you walk on light gray cement, you might be a little bit more comfortable. So the same is occurring on the glacier ice. The light gray white ice will reflect the sun, uh, but the dirtier ice with all that smoke it, that deposited on it will actually absorb a lot of sun energy and cause more melt. 
So now that we understand, we talked about what's going on in the air, what's going on with the surface. Uh, we can say, oh, and um, yeah, so this is in 2019. Um, and you can see the glacier is not quite white, right? It's actually quite dark. We see a lot of particles that are in the, in the ice surface. We have some really dark spots. We have some other spots that are a little less dark. But overall, uh, on the Columbia ice field, over the last few years, we've seen the surface getting darker and darker. And that's something that we've been measuring in the field. Um, so how much more melt do we see with these two things together? Um, and the answer to that is, well, it depends, because it's really, which is a really unexciting answer, but that's often the answer in, in science. It really depends on what's going on with the air and what's going on with the surface. So for example, in 2017 and 2018, we had about as much uh, sun's energy that was blocked by the smoke in the air. Um, so the impact of the smoke in the air was about equal to the impact of the darker surface. So then in 2017 and 2018, overall in terms of melt, we didn't see a big change, even though there was quite a few things happening. But then in 2019, we had no smoke. It was actually a really rainy summer last year. Um, so there was no smoke at the Columbia ice field, but we had a really dark surface because we just had a bunch of summers with a lot of smoke. And in that case, uh, what our simulations, uh, in our calculations give us, is that the darker surface caused up to 10% increase in melt. Um, so overall, uh, it has increased the melt and it's something that you see year after year, even though you don't actually have fires anymore. So overall, um, the main thing is that the forest fire smoke has a compensating impact on glacier melt. So it's two different things. On fir first, the smoke blocks the sun, which causes less melt, but it also darkens the surface, which causes more melt. Uh, but overall, the smoke deposition on the ice will increase uh, the melt. And even though overall these things kind of balance each other and we don't really see that big of an impact, it's actually in terms of volume of water coming out of the glacier, it's actually really, understand to, really important to understand these processes because if we understand what's going on, it can help us better uh, predict the changes and adapt to the changes. Um, and then the understanding of the system can also help us understand uh, issues like water quality and, and associated impacts. Um, yeah, that's my spiel. Um, and I would pass it on to Julie. And stop sharing. Thanks, Carolyn. <clears throat> that's very interesting. We kind of make an assumption that um, increased soot on the and ash on the glacier will just automatically increase the melt. But until we actually study it like you are doing and understand that the smoke in the air plays a part too in decreasing the melt and balances that out, we wouldn't have known that unless you studied it. So <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. All right, should I start? Can you hear me? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Julie. Okay. All right. Um, great. Well, I'm going to share a bit about the importance of snow, um, especially um, what it means with our water supply. So here is a graph that just um, shares with you what some of the managers in the Pacific Northwest have to deal with. So a lot of our precipitation comes in the winter or in the fall, and a lot of our water use happens in the summer. And so water managers have to, so, so looking at kind of the blue line being when, when the supply is coming and the red line being when the use is happening, those don't jive. And so water managers are, are forced to work to balance the supply and the demand while considering a lot of different water uses. So water for agriculture, water for ecosystems, um, water for communities. And also to balance that with public safety. So thinking about floods and droughts. And, and fortunately, um, in the Pacific Northwest, we have these great water towers. So we have a lot of snow and ice up in our mountains. And so we've been very fortunate that we can have the snow come in the winter and then it slowly melts and it allows us to have the water when we need it in the summer. So here's just another way of thinking about this. If we have snow in April, um, it'll melt slowly throughout the spring and summer. So even though it arrives in the winter, it's available for us in the summer. And so those cups at the bottom, like 
sometimes there's there's a bit of balance between um, the water in our rivers in the cold season and warm season. Like it might vary a bit, but the idea here is it, even though it's arriving in the winter, um, it, it's available in the summer. So in a warmer climate, the challenge here is um, you get less snow and the less snow might be arriving because more of the, the, the precipitation is coming as rain instead of snow or it could also be because it's melting earlier. But the net effect of that is you're getting a lot more water in your rivers and streams earlier in the year. And so there's less water then available in the warmer season. So those awesome water towers that are holding our water throughout the year are, are becoming vulnerable. And what does that mean? Um, so, I've already sort of mentioned water supply and water supply for agriculture, especially in the summertime. There's also water for, for species in our rivers and streams and there's the amount of water, but then there's also the temperature of that water. And if, if the water is just coming from rain versus snow melt, it's gonna be a different temperature and that's gonna affect the quality of the water. Um, changes in albedo, and that was already mentioned by Caroline on the glaciers, but also just whether or not you have snow in the mountains is going to affect um, how warm it gets and if it if snow isn't there it's not going to reflect and so you're going to get just a warmer um, it, it's just going to be warmer and that's going to affect species that's going to affect a whole bunch of fires it's going to affect a lot of things um, and then also another element of the value of snow is if you do have those water towers those lots of snow in the mountains if you're the one turning the reservoir switch to say, oh, I'm going to release water from my reservoir now or later, if you have a lot of snow pack, then you also have a lot of opportunity to do planning because you know it's there, it might not, and you can use it later in the year. If you don't have that snow, you're more vulnerable. You don't know whether the precipitation is going to arrive or not. So the predictability and the way we manage our systems is really influenced by the, what we see with snow. And so, so what does the future look like? I'm just going to very quickly show across the Columbia Basin, um, there's different not all snow is affected in the same way. It really depends on your location and then also the elevation you're at. And there are kind of three different types of um, hydrology that um, we see. One is one a system, a watershed that's already rain dominated. So if you look at this figure, you can see stream flow in this basin happens in the winter time when it's raining. So there isn't a lot of snow and this is the Willamette in, in Oregon. And so that's kind of a rain dominated basin and looking at the black line being historical and the red line being future projections of change, you're not seeing a whole lot of difference in the timing. Then there's other basins like the Yakima Basin, which is a higher up in elevation that are really seeing a lot of changes. So they get their precipitation at the same time as, as the basin in the Willamette, but they're able to hold on to that water a bit longer. But with warmer temperatures, they're starting to shift that um, earlier in the year. And then there's places like the uh, upper Columbia where it's still pretty cold and it's still pretty snow dominated. So there aren't, there's some changes that you're seeing in the projections, but it's not as, um, dramatic yet. And so, so they're able to still kind of hold on to that precious snow so that we have it throughout the year. Um, so, so the upper Columbia really feeds a lot of the agriculture and a lot of what we um, use further downstream, as well as, as what people use upstream also. Um, and so kind of just in conclusion, changes are underway. But I do think we can make more resilient choices. And I get to work a lot with water managers and planners. And they're really thinking about these things and trying to sort out what does climate change mean to them and working on thoughtful innovations for how do you take water at a different elevation in a reservoir so it's colder? Or how do we work on conserving water so that we have it when we need it? Or maybe use less water in the summertime? Um, 
that said, oh, we need future engineers, scientists, and water managers to deal with this, and we also need people in the communications profession, artists, community leaders, to work and to better integrate this, this science with our decision making. And that is what I have. I look forward to the discussion. I'm going to ask, uh, I guess, Ali a question um, that came from the chat bar, and that was, do the ice fields actually recede every year? Does the ice field recede every year? Um, the major, oh, Caroline, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, the major glaciers of the Columbia ice field are all receding at present. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was interesting to hear actually Julie talk because um, the, the last figure shown I sort of would have expected some projected change already, knowing that that's true, that all of the major glaciers are retreating. Um, but the inertia of these systems sort of hasn't allowed for that change to be seen yet in, yeah, in the water that's coming off. Well, well and then another thing to note is some of these simulations are done just looking at the, uh, the hydrology and some, it has some element of glacial melt, but that probably could be incorporated a bit more. So that may um, elevate that, that shift, but just focusing on the seasonal snow, like it's still not yet cold enough to really make that shift happen. And Ali, it's Jim. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about Dr. Clark's study and his projections to 2100 and what that means? Yeah, yeah, I assume maybe Bob was going to talk about that. But yeah, the, the, yeah, sort of the major take home from the study that Jim just mentioned is that um, by 2100, it's estimated that 70% of glaciers in Western Canada. Um, will shrink, shrink relative to the, their 2005 volume, which is a shocking statistic. Um, and that, I mean, that's the take home of, um, of that particular body of research. Wow. So this is also, that's exactly why we are looking like slightly preemptively at this contaminant burden that's sitting up there because uh, maybe right now we're not too concerned, but, um, if if melt sort of hits a certain point and these contaminants that were that were um, put in the atmosphere years and years ago are starting to come to the surface and reach our rivers and streams and ultimately drinking water, uh, we're going to care about it pretty quickly. Yeah, and I think that study also uh, one of the things it mentions, kind of between the time now and the next twenty years, we're going to see some pretty rapid developments taking place up there, which, which I think for all of us is a concern. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, I have Jade's questions in front of me if um, her mic's not working. Um, do you want me to answer sure. her micro? Um, it, so yeah, there's some questions about microplastics. Um, concern about them in the environment and what we expect to find regarding microplastics in these samples and cores that we just took. Um, so I don't know yet. The samples are sitting in a, a big archive freezer behind me, unsampled. But I can tell you that um, recent, like maybe last five years, um, interest has really increased in microplastics in extremely remote locations, um, which include um, parts of Antarctica and the very high Arctic. Um, and depending on where we're looking at microplastics, we care for different reasons. Um, but, but they, so microplastics, they're actual pieces of plastic that are reaching these remote locations through the atmosphere, but they, they absorb, so they can absorb other chemicals as they move through natural systems. Um, but they themselves also are made of various combinations of chemicals and compounds so they can also just give off their own um, you know array of lovely things so I what do I predict I assume we're going to find them um, considering places that folks have found them um, that are sort of farther from from obvious human sources um, and whether they're in concentrations that we'd be worried about yet I don't really know I won't know till we analyze them but 
but I think we'll find them. Um, and uh, uh, Jennifer, you asked about the sampling. There are really specific uh, guidelines that have been developed by colleagues of mine who just do microplastic sampling um, so that we make sure we don't contaminate samples. And this involves wearing that photo uh, with those white suits. Those, that, those suits are made out of Tyvek, um, like what you make, uh, it's on uh, houses. Um, so it's this thin material that uh, it doesn't give off any fibers. It's, um, it doesn't give off anything, any of the plastics we're measuring. Um, and in terms of what's under it, we try to have wool on the outside of everything. And this also goes for measuring a lot of contaminants. Unfortunately, the things that we wear to keep ourselves warm in these cold environments are almost all synthetic. Um, so they're just various, um, yeah, various synthetic materials that we don't want near our sampling site. Um, so we always walk, we walk upwind of wherever anyone has been. You scrape off a few centimeters of surface, um, of surface snow. You've got this Tyvek suit on, uh, nitrile lab gloves. Sometimes I'm asked for some of these things. Um, you're really just sure you're introducing nothing um, to that fresh snow as you put it in the microplastics case into a silicone bag. Um, so yeah, each, the sampling for each thing is pretty particular. Very interesting. Um, well, I wonder if we can move on and try um, Rosie. Rosie has a question for, I think, Julie. How might the melting glaciers affect the health of living organisms? Um, so how are living organisms going to be affected by melting glaciers? Um, I think other panelists might chime in on this one as well, but in general, even just the changes in snowmelt are are really um, quite impactful. Um, so things get warmer and it changes how our water cycles. It changes whether it rains or it snows and how snow melts. Um, and it affects different species in different ways, like increased in fire could, could have a pretty significant impact on terrestrial organisms. Um, increased temperatures might have a, a pretty big impact on, on um, different um, bugs and, uh, and the inc changing melt patterns and temperatures can have a pretty big impact on, on fish species and other um, aquatic organisms. Um, we're all part of this big system and we all depend on water. And so when the water changes, then we step outside of kind of what we know. Um, but I'd also welcome others if you want to chime in. Thank you. I could give an obvious OCP answer. Um, this DDT um, that I talked about a couple times when I was talking, um, which was banned tens of years ago, but, but you know, we're seeing it coming, melting out now from snowpacks. Um, the reason that we care about that is exactly um, a, it's your question. It's it's because we care so much about what it does, um, all the way from the bottom of the food web to to people, um, and even in fact in the in the 1960s, um, uh, a woman Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring um, that kind of kind of kicked this off. Um, and one of the things she noticed was how this chemical DDT was impacting things like. Um, when birds were born, how thin their shells were, um, which is just crazy. But these chemicals can do all sorts of things to natural systems. So, so in that example, this chemical was shown to have this direct link with um, basically how easy it was for certain species of new birds to, to survive. Um, uh, yeah, so that is such a good question. Um, and, and that's just one of many, many examples. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think we had a question from Allie, and when we're get it, while we're getting her um, kind of queued up, I noticed in the chat there is one question. Maybe Julie, you want to address this? That says, "Why do most of the basins from melting glaciers end up in the states rather than Canada?" 
that the the topography so water travels from high elevations to lower and so it's it's just the route the quickest route to the ocean and that just happens to be through through the u.s although um there are melt that goes into the columbia but also melt that goes into other um watersheds too i just study the the columbia so i didn't show that when i was sharing but um, there, there's definitely other places this glacial melt goes. Yeah, and the materials that we had up on the splash page were actually showing just the um, the watersheds kind of in Alberta and not showing the ones in the States. So, all right, I think Allie has, is up. Um, Allie, do you have a question for us? Um, yeah, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, um, so I know that sometimes tourists um, and like tourists travel over the ice fields, like in trucks and stuff. And I was wondering if that had a bad impact or an, just an impact on a drinking water. I can take that one. <laughs> um, so Ali, I don't know if you've been on the buses that go on the Athabasca Glacier. Um, I, we use them to go on the bus and there's actually, there's a big pond of water right before the glaciers get, uh, the buses get on the ice. And they do that to wash the wheels so that the wheels don't get, are not filled with mud. So then they don't track a bunch of stuff on the glacier that would then make it darker and make it melt more. So they try to mitigate the impact of it and have less impact on the glacier. But obviously everything that we do has an impact, right? So if you have more car traffic and more buses with the exhaust and you have more humans there that are walking around and eating and potentially like dropping their granola bars on the ground so there is we do some we're there so we are having an impact but we're making efforts to make sure that that impact is as little as possible um so that so yeah so it's a, it's again i want a little bit of a it depends the, we also might be interested to know that the Columbia Icefields is the only glacier in the world where they allow vehicle traffic onto it. And uh, so that, that is actually a concern for Guardians of the Ice. Well, and also vehicles other places can actually affect the ice as well. And that's largely through emissions and increases in greenhouse gases. So even though it's not a direct effect, you do have uh, effects of, of the choices that you make just to drive your vehicle down the road or to fly somewhere um, or how you use energy can affect um, how melt happens also. Great. Um, I think we'll move to um, Hacken um, who has a question. John, if you can get um, his sound up. Um, and then while we're doing that, um, someone want to answer this one how did you guys get into a job where you studied glaciers did you go to university for a certain degree so maybe a quick answer from everybody what was your i guess well not your one degree because you have more than one so what, what was your degree in? well i'm still in school so uh, i'm still a student even though my job is mostly just doing research um so it's like a job but so yeah, so it's a lifelong process to learn to study glaciers. Uh, but I studied earth sciences and then did a focus on hydrology um, to better understand the water aspect of glaciers. Ali, what about you? Um, I was just calculating in my head <laughs> how many years of school I've been in. Um, I did a, a bachelor's and a master's and a PhD. Um, so that's 11 years it took me of schooling. Um, to become a glaciologist and I I guess I I have always really been fascinated by ice and um, and how it how it fits into our whole um, global system and I I love being in icy environments uh, just kind of exploring as well so so it's a I think the personal connection to these really cold harsh places led me to to study them but yeah it took a lot of years um, to get to get to here. <laughs> Julie, what about you? So I also did a lot of degrees. I, I did a bachelor's in biology, then a master's in environmental science, and then a PhD in civil and environmental engineering. And like what drove me to 
get those degrees was that really kind of connecting. I love science, but I also love connecting my science with the decisions that people have to make. And so engineering was really kind of applied science. And so I, I love it. And thinking about water is a kind of a natural way in which you can connect science and like the physical process with the, what people really need to function on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks. Um, Hacken, you have a question. Uh, my name's Hawken, and thanks for taking my question. Um, here's my question. Is there a possibility that the Columbia Icefield glaciers will melt to the point that they will flood cities or towns? What can we do to prevent this issue from happening? Thanks. Who wants to take that one? Carolyn, I think. Yeah, I can take that one again. Um, so. It happens that if there's if it gets really hot for a few days or a lot of rain, you could have flood from the glacier, uh, where you will have a lot of melt and then you could flood. But the interesting fact is that as the glaciers get smaller and smaller, so as they're retreating uh, quite fast, uh, there's less ice available to melt. So there's less chance that it would flood something completely. So as the glaciers recede, there's actually less chance that the glaciers will cause the flood and more chance that it would be really high rain events that would cause floods. Um, but and to try to prevent this kind of disaster, uh, it's really important to understand the system. So like the work that we all do to understand hydrology and glacier melt and the weather, uh, it helps us build uh, models and to predict uh, when these floods could happen so that we can um, evacuate towns, for example, in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, Jim, have you noticed any other questions in the chat that we could address? We have time maybe for one or two more and then we'll move to closing comments. Yeah, actually, had somebody asked a question of me and they must be a climber. <laughs> the question to me was, uh, uh, have I noticed the change in the, the uh, ice climbing routes at the Columbia Ice Field? And uh, the answer is, is yes. When I, um, look at mountains like Mount Athabasca and that when we first climbed it in the early uh, 70s, there was way more ice on the north face of that particular mound than what it was last summer when, when I climbed it. So the, the, the uh, glacial ice that's on these faces is, is rapidly disappearing. And another mound, Mount Bryce, which is on the outer kind of western edge of the ice fields, it has a huge north face and uh, when I was in there a couple of years and looked at it, it had almost disappeared, as well as um, Mount Andromeda, which is another one of the mountains that you see uh, from the highway. There's a really popular climbing route on there called Sky Ladder, and that always used to be ice, and now in the summertime, the ice is all gone, and we're just looking at rocks. So it is changing quite, quite rapidly. You know, I want to jump in because I just saw this one question that I think is interesting in terms of the timing. Um, and the question is, during quarantine, the pollution has gone down quite a bit. So how does the effect, how does this affect the melting of glaciers? Um, who would like to take a stab at that one? I think the short answer is, sadly, um, I was reading about this uh, yesterday, I think that uh, even though there has been a decrease in emissions during this interesting time of people not moving around the world as much, um, it, will, it has no impact on, on climate change, on global warming. Um, it's sort of the wrong time scale. Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't uh, sort of maybe use this opportunity to reconsider what we all do in our daily lives and how much fossil fuels we all use um, but this sort of COVID impact on climate change, um, there is not, there's no direct link there. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's not sustainable. I mean, people haven't been moving around because of COVID. And as things ease, ease off on that, there'll be much greater movement. And, and if anything, it'll actually lead to probably greater uh, emissions than that as things start kicking up and, and people start moving around again. 
Great. Well, there's so many great questions that we have in, in the chat, and we're going to get to some of those after. But just in case there's anyone who has to leave at the hour mark, um, what I want to do at this time is I want to ask each of our scientists in one minute to state the most important thing that you want to get across to participants in this webinar. And um, I guess we could stay, stay with our current order, and we'll start with Ali, if that's all right. Sure. Um, okay. I think the most important thing, I suppose, is staying positive because some of this, <laughs> all of this work can seem a little overwhelming and, and then it leads to feeling, um, at least for myself, like, well, what can one tiny little person do? But, um, but we all can make changes in our lives, um, you know, to, to use less fossil fuels and, um, change light bulbs in our house and do these things that seem small, but cumulatively when we come together, make a big difference. Um, even on, even on the, in these issues we're talking about right now, um, we can all make a difference in terms of how much CO2 is in the atmosphere when everyone makes small changes. So um, yeah, just positivity and, and we can all make a difference. Thanks. Um, Carolyn. Uh, yeah, I would, I totally agree with Alison. I was about to say something very, very similar. So I will say plus one to her and I will take a slightly different path and say, um, well, the mountains are changing a lot. And a lot of the time we don't quite see them because they're quite far. In Alberta, we're lucky to have them fairly close by, but um, mountains have really far reaching impact. So you might live in the prairies or you might live on the coast, but actually a lot of the water that you have uh, in your backyard comes from the high environment, so the mountains. Um, so keeping in mind that even though the mountains can be far and it can seem like glaciers retreating far in the mountains, <laughs> whatever, uh, it actually has impacts for a large part of the human population. Um, so wrapping our mind about the fact that it's not because it's not happening right in our backyard that it's not impacting us. Thanks. And Julie. Great. Well, I'll plus one and plus one. <laughs> so to what you guys said, but I think just the general um, idea that snow and ice is really important and it has these kind of downstream effects that we don't necessarily think about um, that changes are underway. But in the midst of that, there are these amazing innovations and people thinking through like, how can I rethink the way that I use energy, but then also rethinking the way that you use water. And there's gonna be so many opportunities for people who are wanting to be creative and wanting to like take a challenge and, and make it into something that's an opportunity. And I, I, like there's a need for future engineers, there's a need for future scientists. So if you love that, go for that. But there's a need for people who are really good at communicating these ideas to a broader audience. There's a need for people who can um, make an emotional statement to use art and to really inspire that way. Um, there's a need for leadership, like community leaders, business leaders, like in whatever path you end up deciding on going forward, there's a place for you to really um, engage and the fact that you're on this call and listening in like you're 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 making steps in that direction so i've just been really inspired by the youth movement and i i think i'm in a better place because of where you all are going with this so i would encourage you to keep going Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of our scientists for joining and all the students and teachers and other participants interested in water and climate change and Alberta's glaciers. Um, I want to thank Alberta Ecotrust for um, funding this webinar today. Um, and just to remind everyone, I'll be sending out kind of a Google form so we can gain some feedback. This is our first ever webinar and we had a few technical issues, but um, um, and I apologize for that, but um, we uh, want to find out if there were any other sh issues, uh, what you liked about it also. Um, 
I would encourage everybody to go to www.albertatomorrow.ca and check out our land use simulator. There are lesson plans on Alberta glaciers. There are interviews with people like Ali. Um, there's imagery of Alberta glaciers. You can watch some videos and it'll be like you're just walking on a glacier. So I encourage you to go and check that out. Also, please go to the Guardians of the Ice website at um, www.guardians.ca of the ice.com and unfortunately we didn't get to hear from um, Bob Sanford but his book Vanishing Glaciers is an amazing book um, it's a quite comprehensive read on Albert or on uh, water as great pictures in it um, it's available through local bookstores and through Rocky Mountain books um, and um, I know that we said we would do this in an hour, but we've asked our panelists to stay on for another 15 minutes so that we can continue asking them some questions. So if you need to leave, thank you once again for um, joining, but we um, can go for some more questions. If um, you wanna stay on the call, please do so for another 15 minutes or so. Um, Jim, do you have any questions lined up that we can continue our discussion? Well, we have one that um, I believe was answered a little bit, but I think he's looking for some clarification. And it goes, will you please answer this question? Because when ice melts in the water, the water level stays the same. Does that mean when the ice pack melts in the, in the water, the water won't rise? So therefore, the fear of flood is unreasonable. Who wants to take a stab at that one? I, I can. Yeah, Karen, you kind of answered that a little bit before. I can yeah, so maybe take another stab. When so, if I understood this right, so your so if you have a glass of water with ice in it, the ice is already in it, so the water is already high. But if you have a glacier that's on land and it's melting, then you're adding water. So that's where. Uh, like that extra water is not accounted for already. So it's actually increasing the amount of water that's coming. Um, so then you will have, you can have floods. So it's the same reason why Antarctica, if it melts, it can actually bring sea level rise up because it's actually ice that is on land. So when it melts, it adds water to the ocean. Uh, but sea ice um, that is already in the water won't impact uh, because then it won't impact sea level because then it's more like the ice cubes that are already in your glass of water. Did I get, I was a and little bit a question. That was my take on it. The other piece of that is temperature, um, which isn't exactly your question, but it, it's another aspect to this, which is that um, as, as global oceans warm, they expand. Um, so simply the increase in temperature of, of the ocean will cause, will cause rise as well, um, because warmer water takes up more volume than colder water. And if I could play off that just a little bit too, another element of flooding is how intense the precipitation is. And when you have warmer air, it, it takes up more water. So it gets more humid, which also means there's more water that can come out of it in one big dump. And so you get kind of just different precipitation patterns that, I mean, and again, like exactly where and when and what the precipitation is going to do is a big question, but all indications point to you're going to have more moisture in the atmosphere, which would indicate a likelihood of more in, more intense or larger duration or larger events when you do get rain events. And another big element of that is if it's warm and it's raining in the mountains, you might just get all the rain coming down if it's colder and it rains in the mountains some of that rain is going to be snow and it'll stay and so you'll get less flooding because of that thanks i think this is fascinating too because we're talking about water and everyone thinks oh i've learned the water cycle since i was little but there are so many aspects so many uh it's so much more complex than sometimes we make it out to be when we're talking about water and snow and ice and what happens so jennifer i retrieved a question i thought might be interesting to address and it is also connected with water supply from richard l it says 
What is mainly addressed to Julie, but any, I guess anyone can answer. What are we doing, if anything, to mitigate the loss of early melt? Can our infrastructure mm -hmm. accommodate storing water earlier? Great question. Um, I think that as with all great questions, the answer is it depends. Like we do have reservoirs that we've built that can hold back some of that water, but often the reservoirs are much smaller than the total amount of water that goes through. So if you know you're not gonna get any more precipitation that year, like you could fill up your reservoir a bit more and hold on to that water and then you would have it later in the year. The challenge though is with changing precipitation patterns and this ability to have more intense precipitation events, there's the fear of flooding. And so how we use our, our reservoir systems is a big question like do we, do we hold on to that water so that we have it for the summer because we don't have the snowpack or do we release it in case there is a big precipitation event and we want to protect people from flooding so like there's this balance that people are having to strike to 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 get at that and reduce that um summer crunch like do we hold on to it because we can or do we not? And then there's the question of, well, are there other ways in which you can think about how you adjust? And I think those are probably where there's a lot of opportunities for innovation. So just changing use patterns or like just a general awareness so people maybe um, don't plant things at certain times of year where they're going to need more water. Like there, there's a lot of ways that we can manage that um, and people are thinking through those and doing those but like there's not a simple solution. Mm -hmm. I have a question for uh, Allie and, and that question was uh, what was the temperature when you were up on the Snowman Glacier uh, oh. gathering the microplastics and, and why do you go up there when it's so cold? Oh okay. <laughs> Yeah, what are you, crazy? <laughs> Apparently. Um, yeah, unfortunately for me, it was actually unseasonably cold. Um, I, I would have expected more like minus 20 C, mid minus 20s. It was in the minus 30s. Um, so it was, yeah, I was actually cold. Um, and it was really cold overnight, closer to minus 40. Um, again, unseasonably cold. But um, the reason that we want to go when it's well below freezing, um, but usually more like minus 20 is the target just for comfort, um, is uh, one reason is that the drill itself is, um, it has a, the, the drill head has these cutters that are steel carbide. And basically if, if any little bit of the drill, especially those little pieces on the head comes anywhere close to freezing, um, you can get a little bit of melt since it's metal. And then the drill is at great risk of getting stuck at depth and a whole cascade of issues can occur. Um, but another maybe more important reason actually is the integrity of the samples. Um, even at minus 10 C, for example, um, that's a bit too warm. Uh, when you take these samples up from, from depth, they're quite cold. And when they come to the surface, um, even if they're just you know, sitting in their plastic bag for a few minutes before we put them into a box, um, a variety of factors can actually cause a little bit of uh, sublimation from the surface. So going straight from the ice to, uh, to vapor. Um, so you can, you can have some, some kind of some chemistry changes in the ice that we really want to avoid um, even, even say at minus 10. So we aim for minus 20, it was in the minus 30s. <laughs> Ali, I noticed a question earlier um, asked, um, how long do you expect uh, until you get the results from the ice cores you took uh, last month? Ah. Um, we would have been analyzing them already. The, uh, a lot of the analyses are closed right now, but I, I'm going to guess with sort of research reopening timelines, um, we will have results by the end of this year. So uh, starting in September, We'll, we'll, yeah, it's on hold kind of till September. The ice has to sit here till then. Um, but we'll start processing the ice. So 
cutting cutting it up into little subsamples and then running it through all the analytical instruments here um, and at Environment Canada for all of these various pollutants. So hopefully end of 2020. Great. And we have some videos up on the Alberta Tomorrow website um, of you talking about some of the technology and instruments that you use in your lab to analyze those ice cores. Yeah. Great. Jim, did you find another question? Well, I got one question here. This is how do glaciers start? <laughs> <laughs> Which one of these scientists would like to address that? How do they start? Yes. Um, uh, in general, you have to have a, a, a cold and or high enough location where snowfall survives through the year. So, so there's enough snowfall um, that it can survive and then get snowed on again the next, the next winter. Um, and then the other piece of it is that to actually turn from just a patch of snow that persists year round into ice, um, you have to have enough accumulation that that snow compacts and compacts and compacts and has the time to actually convert um, from snow to fern to ice. And fern is this intermediate step where um, the bubbles that are trapped within that snowpack aren't quite yet closed off. Um, and when you cross that fern to ice transition, then you have this bubble close off. Um, and then when you actually have um, glacial ice, it, it flows um, slower and in different ways, but kind of like a river. Um, it actually flows um, just by its own weight under gravity. So um, yeah, so the start of that ramble is, is the important part that you can have accumulation of snow long enough that all the, all the rest of what I talked about can happen. Okay, thank thank you. Hundreds of years. What's that? It would take hundreds of years. Uh, the Canadian Rockies glaciers, yeah, it it does. It depends where you are, right? Because accumulation rates can really impact how long that process takes. Mm. We have another question, uh, Nally, it was uh, about the ice cores. Will they not melt when you get them back to the university? And I think Jennifer mentioned that on the Alberta Tomorrow site, there's um, some video of, of the ice core lab. But maybe you can just tell us how cold is your freezer where you store this stuff? The freezer um, that's just behind that door is minus 40. So they, when they're sitting waiting to be analyzed, they sit at minus 40. Um, that's the temperature we like to store ice so that there's absolutely no migration of chemical, any chemical compounds that we're measuring within the stratigraphy. Um, and also that there's no movement of gases, um, which can happen below freezing, but not at minus 40. So they're sitting stored at minus 40. Um, the working freezer is minus 26, I think. Um, so it's cold, uh, but it's a little more comfortable for working in and for the ice being in there for days or even a, a, a week or two, that it's completely fine. Great. Well, I've got a question here that I think that might be interesting is Caleb asked, if all the countries in the world got together and stopped the global warming that's causing climate change, would the glaciers grow back again? <laughs> I suspect this is one of those it depends questions. <laughs> um, I can take a stab at that. Um, so just in the short term, so we're talking like the next hundred years or so, um, so glaciers actually, they react quite slowly to what's going on. So even if we stop like all emissions today, uh, there's so much carbon and gases in the atmosphere right now. So the glaciers will continue to melt. However, if we take action now, um, in a hundred years, we'll see that there will be less melt. So even the study that we talked about earlier, Martin Clark study, there's quite a range. So when we predict how much glacier we will have by 2100, there's quite a range between if we do nothing about climate change, uh, then we will have very, very little ice left in the Canadian Rockies. 
But if we actually implement a climate change mitigation procedure, like if the whole world comes together and reduces CO2, we will still have some ice in the Rockies uh, based on those predictions. So yes, if we all do something, we can, we can change the future and we can keep ice in the mountains. Um, but it is not that simple and there's still a lag and other processes are occurring uh, that make it, it's not a direct uh, link in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Well, we're at uh, 1214. We've gone 15 minutes over. Um, there are many more questions that we just weren't able to get to and some questions on Twitter too. Um, but once again, I just want to thank you guys for joining the webinar and to our panelists for taking the time to answer some of these questions. I think that you've inspired a lot of future glaciologists and water researchers and um, and that's great because it's pretty apparent that we're going to need those types of, of people in the future. So um, thank you very much. Jim, you have anything else to add? Yeah, I was just going to share a little bit of imagery just to kind of take us out of, of our uh, webinar. So I'm just going to bring us back to our shared screen. So this is just to give, give you all just a little bit of an idea of, of what is at the Columbia Ice Fields and what, what surrounds it. And I think for me today, and listening to these scientists, what has really given us is a sense of the fragility of the alpine landscape and the implications that it can have for all, all of us. For so many people around the world, climate change is a real abstraction, and, and we don't for many of us don't feel a connection uh, to it. At Guardians of the Ice, what we want to do is bring the visible, the tangible evidence home to people through the impact of the visual arts, the impact of, of photography, of films, and, and of paintings. And you can see that the beauty here just in some of these images that I'm sharing uh, with you. The video clip that we played at the beginning can actually be found on the Gardens of the Ice.ca or .com website. And the images you're viewing are just some of the examples of, of the beauty that's up there and what we're risk uh, losing. And for us, the Guardians is when we find people make that emotional connection between what their eyes and ears tell them and what the science is saying, we believe that they will be motivated to a higher level of environmental stewardship. And that's really one of our hopes uh, for today is that people leave here wanting to be more and better environmental stewards. And so with that, we'd like you to continue the conversation with your friends, with your family and with your school teachers, because at the end of the day, every little difference matters and, and we can all, all make a difference, which I believe when our scientists were wrapping up, that is what they all said as well. So with that, thank you all for your interest. Um, as Ju as um, Jennifer said, there's a cover of uh, Bob's book. It's a great, great resource. So I highly encourage you to check that out. And a special thanks to my partner, John, who's been monitoring and made this, uh, uh, kind of all the mechanics of this happen today and a special thanks to our panelists for making uh, their time available. And I know these people are all very, very busy. So, so thank you all and, and have a good rest of the day. Thanks everyone. Thanks, that was awesome. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.